Ladies and gentlemen, Fight Club members and uh, non-Fight Club members, welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, we're honoured to have uh, John Spencer from the Modern Warfare Institute Urban Warfare Project. Uh, John's bio, I won't read out for you, I've put it in the chat. It's uh, safe to say he's uh, much more in tune with the uh, urban environment and studies therein than, uh, than anyone else uh, on the call. Uh, so to the topic in question, um, it's no uh, surprise that urban warfare continues to be one of the uh, most difficult and challenging environments for military forces to operate in, whether that be in large scale, high intensity operations or counterinsurgency uh, and peacekeeping. Uh, and a lot of military leaders have touted that this is the domain that we need to excel in to, to defeat future adversaries on the future battlefields. And there are a number of challenges that John is going to talk about in this, in, in this podcast. And in the simulation of, of those challenges, we return to an age-old problem of how do you do scale and complexity in live training when resources are finite uh, and the uh, ability to do that at scale, either on home station or abroad, is limited. So we're going to talk a bit about synthetics and what that can do, whether that's virtual or constructive. And we're going to return to the common theme of Fight Club, which is how to wargame better in urban environments. So that if we are called upon in the future to do that uh, operation, uh, we can we can avoid some of the pitfalls which he will be talking about in, uh, in his historical analysis. So without further ado, John, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Ed. So I'm going to try to share my screen uh, just because I'm a control freak and like to have the slides. You're good, John. Okay. So hey, uh, it's a huge honor of mine to be a part of the UK Fight Club as I've seen it uh watch it grow and and some of you know, the leaders being close friends of mine so i mean i i have varying thoughts on wargaming and, and if you just kind of urban warfare there's words have meanings but for me this is about improving everyone's ability to think about warfare for me it's urban warfare to think better act faster do the things we want to do in war uh so I hope I contribute to that, highlighting some of the things I'm thinking about now and some of the things I, I research. I also always try to make my presentations different uh, and as I learn every day. I, I honestly learn something new about urban operations every day, um, just based on the magnitude of the problem. And hopefully I share some of those with you uh, and hopefully I, I'm new and, and I will try to be bold as I, I am almost free of most of my any shackles and I can I can be as bold and as direct as I want uh, for good or bad. So I am the chair of urban warfare studies at the Modern War Institute. Uh, I have to plug that or I, I really couldn't be here. So follow us on Twitter, Facebook and all your social media platforms. So predicting urban operations. I'm not a futurist. I am I can say from my own understandings of looking at war that most people get it wrong on predicting what the next war battle warfare will be but doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying i usually use a part of my presentation um, trying to convince people that the future of not even the future today's wars are urban the future of war is urban uh, i won't spend too much time on that because i, I want to get past that but I, I can tell you very strongly as somebody a prominent person in this area we do not have agreement in anybody's military um, because militaries are made up of people uh, that agree that this is the future or it is something that we should be um, in the overall slice of the pie spending more and more time on. I'm an advocate <laughs> clearly that we should be um, in, in every aspect, you know, whether it's the globalization trends and you know, most people kind of gloss over when you talk about mega cities, which are cities over 10 million, or the fact that the world is more urban than it is rural. I mean, ideally, I'd like to put only two categories of terrain in general, and the United Nations does. You either have rural or you have urban. The Most militaries don't do that, right? So we have what we call special environments, where you put into that bucket everything from jungle warfare, Arctic warfare, mountain warfare, urban warfare. So it's almost like we, we only view the non-special as the open terrain. Uh, but ideally there's, there's either rural or there is urban. So the history of war 
anybody who studies it will tell you that we all we have always fought for cities. Uh, many of us, the, the few the select few that focus on this or or focus, will say that that has changed and we fight in cities now for multiple reasons. And I'll put a plug out for my dear friend, Dr. Anthony King from Warwick University there in the UK, who's got a book coming out. Uh, urban warfare in the 21st century, which tries to communicate um, strongly in this argument that the future of today, today's wars are urban, tomorrow's wars will be urban based on multiple factors on you know, <clears throat> demographics, asymmetry of warfare, uh, the size of our militaries as we're all smaller than anything we could imagine if we, whatever you hold in your mind is major urban wars and peer competition. We're all smaller than we've ever been. Uh, you know, the trends of today's warfare, which I'll try to talk to you about, and then of course global warming. So I cover urban operations in general. And this is this slide. So what do I do? You know, am I an academic? You know, am I a practitioner? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit different, I think, because I get I have a dream job. I get paid to follow urban dream job. operations in any thread. I, I go where I want. So I have a podcast series that I just decided to start up as I, I almost feel like I'm one of the guys in that classic photo of the elephant, you know, the blind men touching an elephant and asking what it is. I'm just one of those guys feeling around that elephant, which is urban operations in my mind, in urban warfare in general. So I started a podcast series, which is really a, a research series of my own that I'm sharing with everybody else as I seek out experts in every possible domain of urban operations, both in the military and out of the military to, to have a better understanding of what it's gonna take uh, to understand the future of combat. Uh, and that covers everything from your know, classic academic urban studies of what is a mega city, feral cities, global cities, it, it, the topics are, are, are huge, down to how are we training today um, in the US military. I, I, I do a lot of re field research in other militaries, looking at how they do it, how they think about it. Um, I, you can put my research into two buckets, really. One is understanding urban environments, which is huge. Uh, as the world is more urban than it's ever been, uh, most countries are over 80% urbanized. The only reason that you get down to like 50% urbanized is because we're including the entire globe even un uninhabitable spots. We are urban creatures as part of civilization. Uh, and so I, I spend a lot of time understanding cities across the range of military operations. So everything from interviewing a police chief to, to understand how cities are secured to post-disaster, you name it. That's a very big topic, understanding urban environments. Uh, you could argue, and we most people will, like a military commander given a military mission doesn't need to know everything about an urban environment, but there's there's probably keys to an urban environment that he's not thinking about, which I'd argue, he, he, depending on the mission, he needs to, and that's the other bucket. So I have two buckets. One is understanding urban environments. The other one is understanding how to operate in them. If you look at my podcast series or my writing, um, I do a lot of that on understanding how to conduct a military operation. I think that's where wargaming to me, man, is it so big. Uh, as I learn more about how it's been done in the past, um, whether we're making informed uh, um, courses of action or informed experimentation versus you know, kind of you're know, thinking through different ideas, but that should be you know, informed. Uh, and then I have, of course, the list of bad habits. I think that we all carry forward when we when I mentioned to you urban operations. So the biggest thing that I do, and another reason I love my job, is travel out to urban op warfare training events. So I, I'm, I live in Colorado, so I'm close to our big national training center, which, uh, which has the biggest U.S. military urban warfare training site, uh, which is Rajesh City in the National Training Center in, in California. So I, I love to be welcomed out there, and the team out there is so, so awesome, um, really fighting the fight at the operational level from brigade. And there's one mission that we do out there today in part of the decisive action training environment, right? Lots of thinking and gone into that, lots of investment in that city, uh, over 800 buildings. And usually every rotation, there is one mission of attack the city. So attack the city of Rajesh. Uh, and, and I have some thoughts about that, but that's the my most favorite thing to do. You know, I love doing talks and 
especially the question and answer period that we'll get to. I love doing that and challenging my own thinking, learning. Uh, but the most fun I have is actually visiting units, uh, whether it's a defense planning exercise or a brigade level attack of an actual train using the equipment we have today versus you know incorporating other thinking or equipment. So ha bad habit number one um, that I, I would press anybody who's wargaming, thinking, training, preparing for urban operation is the belief that enter a clear a room, close quarters battle is the foundation of preparing for urban warfare. I strongly believe that that is not in full visibility. I'm a, I'm a retired infantryman. I was 25 years infantry uh, enlisted and officer. So I love inner and clearer room. I love battle drill six for the US military. Um, I hate that if I talk to any military audience, that is what they hold in their mind. Um, and I believe that it's been misapplied in so many different operations and gotten us in a lot of trouble. The, the CQB history could be a presentation in and of itself, but uh, they, we used, Ralph Peters has a famous quote saying that if you talk to a military audience about urban operations, he thinks about buildings. Uh, and that references you know, the fact that you, urban terrain by definition means buildings, your build up area, people, a population and the infrastructure to support them. There's lots of reasons why we don't replicate the people and the infrastructure very well. Some of that's just mission based on based on the mission that we believe the highest risk, highest, highest likelihood mission that we're going to conduct a military operation. Uh, I would change that quote to be, you know, if, you, if I talk to a military audience today, whether that's a, a junior soldier or a senior officer, um, he's going to be thinking about entering and clearing rooms as a foundation for urban warfare. And I think that is a mistake on so many levels because um, the battle drill six, which didn't come or you know, isn't an evolution of urban warfare history, uh, major combat operations in urban terrain. It, it's an evolution of a counterterrorism tactic developed after the failed raid of 1972 um, that was merged with our post-war war II fighting on build up areas tactics. Uh, but now it's, it's gotten such a cultural momentum that that's what people think about in urban operations. And the, the one thing you have to have, whether you're simulating this in a, a war game, like a VBS three squad level training event is that once you've lost the, the element of surprise, entering and clearing a room through a door is the last thing I would want you doing. It just is. And, and I can get into details about that, um, but, that tactic is meant, you know, the stacking on next to a door, it, it assumes a permissible environment. And that's not the, the type of combat I like to talk about. I like to talk about high intensity combat against a, whether it's a peer, near peer, highly motivated um, non-peer adversary. Uh, if you think you'll be stacking on doors, it, it's just not what history shows. It's not what you should be doing. So the, I think the foundation of urban operations preparations needs to change um, and, and almost not a race because CQB is great and it has lots of applicability, but it's what's, what, what is, if the environment has changed as in permissible to non-permissible type of enemy situation, all that has changed, then what's your, what's your next battle drill you want soldiers doing? What's the next approach that builds upon your overall course of action for the attack or defense of a city. So that's the bad habit number one. I, I don't know how to break it. I just like if people recognize it uh, in the way they think. So overall, very broad brush, the two challenges for military formations preparing for urban operations is number one, the challenge of replicating the environment, right? Uh, that we mentioned in the intro, right? So if you can't physically replicate the three aspects of urban operations, right? The physical terrain, the density of the physical terrain, uh, and, and which is why I put the city of Rajesh up there, all of our military training sites, which I love to travel to around the world, have an issue with density, just because we wanna be able to drive our vehicles around them, uh, inside of them in different ways, or it's just part of building codes for us. It's it's great, but it's just not the reality of 
any urban area I can think of that's battle has happened before, whether that's the, the sheer amount of rubble that is created in the preparation for an urban operation, whether that's aerial bombardment, artillery bombardment that you should be doing um, to part of your overall plan for an urban operation, you better be targeting known enemy locations, uh, obstacles, things like that. But the sheer amount of rubble that that causes to your formation, and we kind of wave away that mobility issue, which causes us to apply different formations that don't apply to it. So this, uh, this problem of replicating the environment is, is a huge military problem. I agree with multiple lines of investment. So I recently came out with an article with some, some good friends that are way smarter than me about the use of virtual reality to prepare for close combat in urban terrain. Um, I don't think that's the way of the future. Uh, I, you know, if I had different pots of money, I, I, I would still be investing in physical structures just based on the human nature of this and the cognitive load it causes on not just the, the close combat formation, you know, people trying to gain momentum with the enemy, gain contact and maintain contact and destroy enemies, but from even the, the commanders trying to maintain visibility of what's going on in the urban terrain uh, to command and control. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is replicating battle effects. So unlike any other of the special environments, which what we call, I don't agree with, uh, the urban terrain is based on the way we all approach training uh, or even wargaming is that how hard it is to replicate the battle effects of urban combat, whether that's the effects of an our, our munitions on the terrain, uh, whether that's the direct fire weapons, everything from M4, you know, personal weapons to anything else you can bring to bear in that environment how hard it is to replicate while you're doing your planning, while you're doing your training, to, to actually get to the reality of what actually happens based on the structures of where an enemy is located. If you're the attacking forces or, um, which I'll talk about later, if you're defending the effects of your weapons on that terrain, whether you actually have concrete penetrating munitions or what, how long it will actually take you to reduce to move past a fortified building, uh, which I'll talk about, because it's so hard for us to replicate battle effects. Um, that we, we say for the US military at the combat training centers, we can only replicate about 60% of our weapons about battle effects. There's a new version of miles that, that that will do to implement that. And, and sure, this is something that simulations can, can assist with. Um, one thing simulations can assist with if they think about it correctly about the effects of weapons and a non-permissible environment that you're not just going to be running down the streets um, on your approach, your your course of action, and the amount of time it's going to take you to actually move down the street. So those are two big challenges, replicating the environment, replicating battle effects. Um, so the other challenge is what, what do you hold in your mind is, if I say urban warfare, different audiences, different contexts, I like that you know war gaming because we can narrow that down, right? But the problem is, is I learn something about urban warfare every day. Um, I think that if you're planning military operations, whether you're war gaming an actual course of action for a mission you've been given, or you design a a, a game to where you can you know, do multiple iterations and really think about it, I think most people are carrying something forward with them in their mind. Um, so I, I have this this slide that lots of people have seen. Um, it, it lists the, the, the phases of urban operations across the range of military operations. You know, we say we, we're prepared, we're going to start preparing for urban operations across the Romo offense, defense, and stability, right? And DISCA. Uh, so let's take stability and DISCA off, off the map because we, you know, we're, gonna, we're going to invest and design our militaries for the highest risk, highest likely, combat situations we believe against the greatest threats, uh, whether that's China, Russia, uh, North Korea. So let's take, just for time being, let's take stability and disco off the map. Still, you're going to hold something in your mind that's gonna help you think about um, when you 
start thinking about urban operations, when you think about a mission, you're holding something in your mind, whether that's World War II battles, um, where there was, I would, the law of armed conflict was still there, but I put that in almost a total war category, um, where a belief of aerial bombardment will achieve your objective is, was higher, where, you know, the, the rules of engagement were, were changed based on the necessity of the, the actual problem. Uh, and then I slide my, my scale to the right where you have more bigger battles uh, since World War II, major urban battles um, that have forced militaries, whether they wanted to or not, to engage in high intensity combat in dense urban terrain. And that's that list from uh, Ortona, you know, some of the World War II battles, which were more controlled um, than I think some of the, the bigger battles were down to modern day operations. And, and I'll hit one of those recently that I think is um, sometimes talked about, but kind of missed. And if you really think the character of warfare is changing, um, you better not be excluding the urban nature of it. So the Battle of Susha in 2020 um, is something I've been looking at pretty hard recently with, with some other people. Uh, and you have limited, you, you have the mission always matters. So what, what is the mission? Um, and I'll talk about that, that sometimes we want to, we will exercise, we want to exercise, um, whether that's a limited campaign. So, you know, a regime change, penetration to do a re regime change, uh, just a denial of terrain, you know, Sadr City, which I happen to be a part of just by blind luck of just eliminating somebody's ability to shoot rockets in a place you don't want them to, similar to Israeli experiences in Gaza, of your limited objective, in, into dense urban terrain, uh, achieve your objective and, and then pull out. Counterinsurgency in urban terrain, some, uh, complex, less appetite for it now, doesn't mean it, it won't continue. We're gonna hold our lessons. We learned a lot of hard lessons. Um, and then farther to the right, counterterrorism operations, right? So that's, that's a intelligence driven raids can be even large scale raids um, into dense urban terrain with a limited objective and then pull out. Uh, that that counterterrorism that CQB is so closely aligned to. So I study all of these, of course. So this, this list is, is a great list. I can add a whole bunch to it. Um, I study all of these. So I, I would like to take this opportunity to announce the urban warfare project case studies that we will start Hopefully tomorrow morning we'll be published the first one, which is on the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, me and a close friend of mine, Major Jason Giroux out of the Canadian Army, um, decided to take on all of these. And because many of these reside in our, our minds, but some people um, understand some of it, don't understand all of it. So we took on the bold, uh, audacious goal of taking each one, summarizing it in less than 4,000-ish words, depending on how much my editor loves me that day, uh, and then the main lessons you take from it, right? So their case studies will be at the Modern War Institute website. Uh, we're starting with Stalingrad because Stalingrad holds so much cultural significance and, and so much in military, uh, national security, civilian minds about urban combat. So we took that on, which is not an easy task to summarize a battle that it was basically a war uh, in and of itself and summarize that and then give the lessons that we as students of urban operations with the help of our research associate, uh, Harshana, which I, I think is on the call. I can't thank her enough, uh, but summarize that. Why does that matter to war gaming? To me, it, it, if I was king for a day and I knew somebody was doing a war game, whether that's a part of an MDMP or just in, whether that's a part of uh, a defense experimentation, given a mission, then I would hand whoever is a participant in that, everybody from the blue four to the red red element to the white element, I would hand them these case studies and say, this, given this mission, it, this mission has happened in the past. Uh, it most aligns with a couple of these historical cases. Just to get an example of this is what happened then under all the different contexts always matters. Um, I would love for that to be a part of it and I will tell you that um, kind of like that quote about the, per, the nobody ever, you know, the man who steps in the river is never stepping in the same river because he's changed. Every time I look at these battles, um, I'm not the same person reading that, that battle. So I learn something different every time I read about a battle. So it's really hard for me to like definitively like 
bam, that's the summary of that battle. This is what I think I got out of that. Uh, but it's necessary to move forward. Um, it's part of this, I think, expanding your mental reservoir as to quote you got uh, the, the Fight Club webinar number one, which I highly recommend, uh, it expands it. Um, but I'm really excited about the project. Uh, and you know, I'm no historian, so give me a little bit of credit on that. So if you talk about tasks, like what, what, what would, what do you want the army to invest in? What do you want militaries to invest in? What missions of dense urban terrain, right? Because like I said, I'm the, the guy touching the elephant. I, I was just on a call with a, now a close friend in New York City who's got some major, we have a, the US Army has a bunch of major um, things going on there because it's, it's, it's our biggest mega city. It's an amazing relationship with the military. But for like two hours, and he's a former, he's an active duty SWAT uh, lieutenant, knows more than I'll ever know about CQB and urban operations in a mega city. Um, but the mission does matter. What, what's the mission? What's the context? So this is the clearest language I've ever seen created by the U.S. Army about where it might invest. Um, there is no mission or what we call a mission essential task for the U.S. military to do operations in urban terrain. Um, there's reasons for that. There used to be one. If I was you know, Secretary of Defense, I'd create, bring it back. Um, but the reason for that is urban is under our parlance, urban is a condition. We should be able to do our main mission essential task, no matter what the condition is or what the environment is. So we have like conduct an attack, conduct a defense, conduct it, you know, all these things. None of them are urban. Uh, there, 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 there was one created once called uh, basically conduct an attack of an urban area as, at the battalion and brigade level. It's not there, but this is from our multi-domain operations. As people thinking about the future, a great uh, publication that I have at the bottom that says, we basically we're going to we're going to train it at echelon, given all the force design and force structure assumptions that are in our current way for the future and our modernization plan. There's three essential tasks that you want the army to be able to do. Uh, one of them is to isolate urban areas to control logistical supplies. Right, so control a line of communication through urban terrain. And I love this um, because I think it, it, it gets no play in, in the things that I observe. It gets assumed away. Uh, I think it, gets, it is a bad habit that we have had for the last 20 years of engaging urban operations where there is a periphery that we can launch into the area of operation, right? So I think in the future, US military uh, and the co grander coalitions will face an urban environment where there is no periphery, the entire operating environment will be urban. Um, and if you look anywhere in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, you're going to find entire coastlines that are urban. Then you're not going to have the standoff um, to nodal cities is what we're used to in the Middle East. So what does what does it take to control a line of communication? And how far, if you, if you, if you do an operational or how far can you extend your lines of communication um, before you're you're overcommitted uh, in your basing and all that. I love that task. So let's do it, but let's really do it. Next one is penetrate the exterior boundary and interior structures of urban areas. I love, I, 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 again, that, that, that is spot on to something that I would want my army prepared to do. Penetrate into an urban area, which we have to define the zones of that, both the exterior and the interior structures, which gets back to that, if you have somebody using the, the, the actual structures of urban areas, what is your plan to gain? So this is the next one, which follows right through that, gain and maintain contact with the enemy inside dense urban terrain. Uh, if your plan, which I'll talk about, is to just enter it um, along an admirable approach and search and destroy, it's probably going to go bad for you. Uh, if your plan is to identify a line of avenue of approach and that you're going to enter and clear every structure using close quarters battle that'll end um really after the first hour or two and you'll stop doing that as you're taking casualties uh, and you'll on the fly adapt which is what we do what we want our forces to do is adapt um, and start doing other things to do this task gain and maintain contact with the enemy i love it um 
and then it has some things about the field army. I don't see this really translated outside of this document, and, and I hope that's the future. And if I was doing war games, identifying what scenario, what task do I want to give to my my friendly element uh, or military element to to really break apart our bad habits, identify our assumptions that we're, we're using to go forward, so that we don't learn lesson, relearn lessons from the past. So this is another slide I usually put up, right? So if you don't believe that the feature of peer conflict is urban, um, you don't believe that this trend, which I'm showing you right here, the resurgence of city attacks has exponentially increased because of many factors that we talked about upfront about predicting urban operations. I don't have to predict it. I can just look around the world. Um, the resurgence of city attacks, as in somebody got to a city before you did, now you need to go get them out uh, or reclaim that city. Each one of these has its own context, but as you can tell, they, they've exponentially increased over time where that's, that's the character of warfare in my mind today. Now, if you play out a war game in a theater of campaign, you may argue yourself away from that this is what's going to happen, that despite the fact that cities have always been the strategic objective, you're either fighting for it or you're fighting in it. Based on the current character, the size of our militaries, the advancements in technologies, if you don't believe that this will continue and that this is the next mission of your for your operation, I, man, I, I just don't, I don't know if I, I can follow that line of thread of imagining a theater of campaign where there isn't heavy combat in cities, for cities, uh, for many reasons. Uh, let's say if you did believe me that those operations are, will continue um, going forward and that there is national interest for US, for UK, for, for everyone um, to be able to do those missions um, to seize urban terrain, to clear it, to fight in it, um, that we won't get drawn into it. If you believe that we will, what would be some things that I would incorporate into my um, thinking, my wargaming, to my training events that I don't see today? So I, I'd say that's another bad habit is I don't see people incorporating the realities of modern urban combat in their ideals of what the future will look like. So this is a list of kind of a overall trends, you know, fortified buildings. Uh, I, I just can't emphasize that enough about if, if I'm, so number one, if, if I go back to my list of all the things that I've studied, um, if I go back to that list of city attacks, what's the one thing missing on there? Any talk of a defense, any talk. And, and there are reasons for that. And, and I believe in our soul, um, in the Western way to warfare, to quote the, the, the great podcast series, um, that we are an offensive based military. We, for the US, we're an uh, away game offensive based military, but it, that's just not the history of warfare. If you don't think a part of your offense is not the, the, the requirement to do defense, I get asked all the time. And as you can see from my case studies, I could flip the script and say, okay, on both sides, okay, this side's attacking, this side's defending, this is what they, when they were defending what they did well. One of the major gaps in our thinking is preparing to defend urban terrain front for whatever operational requirement. Uh, it's a huge gap, even in my own research about understanding how to use the environment um, to create what, what we say. If you look at our doctrine, our doctrine is great, um, the NATO doctrine is great, the UK, the US, I just can't find anybody who reads it for urban operations. If you look at it, it's, it's about in accordance with kind of our mentality, 70% offense and 30% defense, if that. We want you to go read the defense doctrine. Um, so fortified buildings has a play in both offense and defense. In defense, you, you better find which buildings are the best um, to achieve your goal in the defense of that train for a certain, however long you're going to be doing it. If you're attacking into urban terrain, uh, I just see people wishing away the requirements to reduce an enemy threat inside of a fortified building. Uh, that goes back a little bit of that CQB, right? Stop doing CQB where you're going through the door and there's a guy just standing there with an AK-47. Just stop it. It's not going to happen in pure conflict. It, if, if he has chosen a fortified building, you're going to fight a battle for that building. 
uh, you, you're going to have to figure out how to close the distance to that building and then how to penetrate like that overall task says to penetrate that structure um, because history shows that though if you if if the defender selects the right fortified buildings he can make people pay in blood and treasure to take a single building so, but i don't see that being replicated in, in any most of the myths that i'm talking about the true um how what it takes it to reduce a, a, a really fortified building and i'm talking concrete ironclad uh rebar reinforced you name it whether it's a an office building, a treasury building, a citadel, part of the old part of a city. History shows of mm -hmm. any of those that I just listened. Uh, another one is complex obstacles. So usually because of the nature of our, our training in, in, in experimentation and everything, you know, there's gotta be a flow to it, right? We only have so much time. Um, if I'm defending urban train and if most people in history that defend urban train, you're going to encounter complex obstacles, uh, which, take a, a deliberate process to reduce that's that is beyond a combined arms breach of the exterior of an urban terrain multiple interior complex obstacles that are what i call momentum stopping obstacles i don't see that as well history shows that you're not going to just flow through urban terrain no matter how good you are um, you're going to have to respond to momentum stopping moments uh, in because of the nature and the complexity of urban operations, right? So just the physical structures and the, the population that no matter what you do to remove them, they're going to be present. So you better be replicating them in some way. So snipers, I just don't see them out there uh, in our thinking. Although it, it, if I was defending, you better bet I'd be using as many snipers from the best vantage points shooting through buildings uh using remote controlled weapons that give me no risk to the individual soldiers to do sniping at any approaching a person that's hopefully going down the avenue that i plan for them ambushes tunnels i don't really have time to get into the underground but if you're not replicating the fact that there is three dimensions to the urban terrain and that the the use of either existing underground or created underground if i'm defending what i usually tell if i especially if it's a small unit Hey, if you're preparing to defend urban terrain, you better start digging the moment you get there. It's just classic aspects of the defense, right? If I, I remember as a private digging, you know, trench line, foxholes and supplementary foxholes, all that. When we get an urban terrain, we're like, okay, I'm gonna put you in this building. Like, no, start digging, uh, start connecting fighting positions, uh, whether that's a trench line, uh, an underground tunnel, a mouse hole, punch a wall through buildings, it's got to be replicated in our environment. Mouse holes is, 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 is one of the interesting things that you'll see across most high intensity urban combat in history is that putting a hole in a, a wall and then allowing you, you, you to move through it in different ways. I don't see it in training outside of the Israeli military, full credit. They have fully understand the, the use of mouse holes and going through buildings rather than trying to Mo be mobile and maneuver through streets and alleyways. It just um, both in attacking and defending is, is so huge. So two two current trends that aren't the trends of the old are the use of vehicle-borne IEDs, house-borne IEDs, which aren't the IEDs even from my experiences. They're they are at a different level. Um, you, whether you point to any of the, the, the wars in the last 15 years in, or battles in Iraq and Syria, the, the use of exponentially more explosive vehicle-borne mobile IEDs, uh, and then what do you have to combat that? It, it, it's a problem, a challenge I don't see replicated. Um, it, it, it can't be wished away. Uh, it, there is very limited current force capabilities that stops them and they found that out like the battle of um, Mosul where they were dropping 500 to 2000 bombs in the middle of four way intersections to create a crater so that the, the, the vehicle couldn't get to the forward line of trace. Is that what you what we plan to do in the next time? I, I don't know. So COTS or civilian off the shelf or military grade UAVs, which I, I'll mention here in about the Nagorno-Karabakh war. Again, it's, it's, it's a modern, 
um, challenge that wasn't present in my own studies of past urban operations. Um, urban train does reduce most ISR capabilities, um, but that ever-present eye in the sky or ever-present ability to strike, it's a it's something that has a challenge, a new challenge, I think, that wasn't as predominant, um, although aerial strike and all that that was prominent in, in some battles. So last one on this, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, is called the what I call the precision fallacy. Uh, full citation, I'm stealing that from my good friend Amos Fox, who's written and, and his writings are amazing about the precision paradox. Um, I think he calls it a precision paradox. I call it the precision fallacy, is this belief that our increased precision munitions will make the urban warfare challenge easier. And that's a fallacy it, it, given by the one, what he calls the precision paradox, which is, I, yes, I can precisely hit a building with high explosives, unlike I ever can have, have had in the past, but that doesn't stop the enemy from the, whoever, the enemy I'm trying to gain and maintain contact with, using that language, I think is wonderful. Um, it doesn't stop them from just moving to the, the building underground or, uh, you know, it doesn't get the effect you want. So now I'm just precisely destroying every building along my avenue of approach. I call it the fallacy because I think the fallacy is, is an over-reliance on it or that it will achieve your objective, which does get to the paradox, but a realization about the amount of precision munitions that have been used trying to pursue that precision fallacy in recent battles, whether it was the complete expenditure of fear level artillery rounds in support to battles in Syria or the complete strategic supply of Hellfire missiles used in the Battle of Mosul to where there are no more. Um, in our war game, you know, are we planning for the amount of munitions uh, required to do the way we, we say we're going to do it? Uh, I think grenades or just hand grenades are one of the logistical things that nobody accounts for. And how many grenades uh, are you going to need to do urban warfare, uh, high intensity urban warfare, if you're going to be um, seizing and holding urban terrain, you're going to need more grenades than you are small arms, in my personal opinion, uh, because that CQB tactic um, has always had throw a grenade in the room first. Um, under a different environment, we we have gotten away from that, or, or you, you a bad habit. We've gotten away from that, but you better end that. So, if I took the one mission that I said before was important about that re resurgence of city attacks. And the fact that we are replicating it, right? So I, like I said, if the National Training Center, the US military does an amazing uh, attack of a city that really gets at some of the challenges of urban warfare, uh, I think that we, my experience is that we get so cognitively overloaded in the planning process, whether you think that's just the, the orders production that we don't really think through, which is the beauty of a war gaming community, thinking through yeah, orders productions are, are very important at the heart of uh, our profession is the ability to communicate orders um, smartly in, in, across the echelon. But this thinking through actual fighting, how much you can get out of a war gaming community um, is that we're not, I don't, my personal opinion, doing the reality of large scale combat operations, whether that's the true element of what it will take to shape an environment prior to the close fight uh, the top picture is the, the Battle of Fallujah. W one of the times I think a true example of joint uh, combined uh, arms maneuver using every tool, almost every tool available at, the, at that time, um, everything from drones to call in fire strikes, um, it was all put into that well-planned operation. All those marks are pre-planned targets that were fired at before the close fight. So every, every street, Every car on the street, again, context matters, um, environment matters, but every street, every car on, on every street along an avenue of approach was struck with an artillery round before any soldier got near it to ensure that it wasn't a VBID. Uh, how are we invested in shaping an operation if, if it's in high intensity combat? Um, and then the more important thing, which I think gets to war gaming and why I think case studies are so important is not doing exactly what the enemy wants you to do in an urban area, or if I'm defending what exactly I want you to do, right? So how are we incorporating the element of surprise 
uh, deception, disruption before getting to the close fight, before and not just doing a frontal attack with our faces. Um, my mentor, General Rainey, says, like, that's not what you going want to do. That's not what we train to do. It's not, it's truly the element of the maneuverous approaches, finding the enemy's weakness, not attacking the enemy the way he wants you to. Uh, in urban train, for some reason, we have a bad habit of doing exactly that. Uh, some of it could be hubris on the, our belief to penetrate any area of operation we want to, given enough time, and then I'm going to maintain um, the initiative, maintain the advantage, uh, superior military technologies. Like I, I just, I'm not, I think it's, it's not reality. So if I was to do a city attack and we were doing a city attack war game, you, I've talked to you like history that shows you there's, there's, a, there's more than one way to do this. There's more than the one way that most people will take out of doctrine. Um, because again, we don't have urban mission essential tasks. We have conduct an attack. So most people will take conduct an attack, um, big task, and then walk through the phases, right? You know, so you penetrate the, the do the combined arms breach, you seize a foothold, you start to flow your forces through, right? That's one way. There are pl plenty of other ways historically, whether it's the, you know, the, the General Rainey, the second battle of Fluja penetrate to the deep middle of the city, turn around and make them fight you, which is also what happened in the, the thunder run of Baghdad city. Um, there is a, the golden bridge what we're calling now where you leave the enemy in, and out uh, and, and then flow through with a purpose intent to pull them out the back. There's a circumvent um, making, you know, controlling parts of the urban train um, through different control measures uh, and then just not entering it. You know, what, what we did in Baghdad and inside our city in 2008 or you see different elements of the siege, but the, the, there's many ways. It's just, do we give ourselves enough time to truly think about that given the, all the variables of, of the mission that we've been given? Uh, and then, like I said, cr creatively think of ways to surprise the enemy, to deceive him, to disrupt the defense in a different way than I think I see classic people doing it given this very specific element. Um, so it to me, it's this truly fighting all weather joint multi-domain maneuver warfare in dense urban terrain so that um, we, it, the enemy, it won't be as advantageous for them to get to the urban space first, um, which is kind of some of the writings on at the kind of a theater level, operational level of warfare is that this the primacy of getting to the urban terrain first or stopping the enemy before he gets to the urban train. Great, that's a, that's a lofty goal and, and, and I hope that works. But what if they get there first or what if we got there first and it's part of our defensive plan to, to hold that piece of train because that's the funny thing about urban areas is that they're usually in for the reasons of civilization in critical spots of terrain where lines of communication flow, where natural rivers flow, where ports of entry flow. I mean, they are important. So I won't go through these. Um, if I was, I wrote a paper about the eight rules of urban warfare. It really should be the eight rules of an, uh, attacking a city um, that are, I think, often assumed away. And so if I was doing experimentation and game, war game with incorporating other pieces of technology, you know, I would look at this list and say, okay, which of these rules of the game, I call them, are you, are you changing? Or are you just, again, going in with a, a frontal attack with your face? Uh, Susha City. So I think the Nagorno-Karabakh War, if, if most listeners have, have probably heard about it, read about it, wrote about it, researched it, and um, everything from it, it, it is the, the sign of future of warfare. It is the sign of the changing character of warfare. It is the, the, the overall Nagorno-Karabakh War, you, the use of proxies, the use of superior aerial um, assets that, that are beyond an Air Force, right? So the, the, the drones have gotten a lot of attention. The drone, the Turkish TPAR, the Israeli Harap suicide drone, you know, the, the, the ability of that to trip forces in the open, everybody, you know, even some people being as bold as tanks aren't as 
um, necessary in modern conflict, which is really bad if, to me. Um, I think one of the missed lessons of the Nar Nagorno-Karabakh war was the, the 2020 Battle of Susha, right? So Susha city is a city on a cliff, on a hill, a very critical ancient fortress city that has been critical in, the, in past wars, um, but became critical in this war. And it became the decisive objective. And, but decisive in my definition is once that city fell, um, Armenia surrendered basically uh, and, and entered a lopsided agreement. Uh, that city based on its terrain should have been heavily defendable, even with a small amount of force. It's surrounded on three sides by cliffs. Uh, it has one main road that goes into it does have a support urban area, which is important, uh, but you should have been able, let's say if we war gamed it and should have been defendable. Uh, it wasn't a superior use of aerial technology that reduced that city and, and one side was able to obtain it and hold it. It wasn't the drones. It, yeah, of course those were shaping operations and, and part of their advancements, but actually whether part of this four day-ish battle, whether it rolled in and all those Azerbaijani capabilities were reduced. Um, this became a close fight. This became a land power fight to be able to get into that terrain and hold it. And the thing that was done, which I think is beautiful, and I don't know if we would have war gamed it ourselves, if we would have created it, is that special operations forces in, in almost a different mode than they're used to in the last 20 years, inserted uh, 400 special forces. Again, th this is open source intelligence. I, I have no insider information reportedly inserted 400 special forces um, over walking in over four days, split into four 100 man groups uh, and moved into that city across terrain that nobody thought possible to include the defenders who didn't defend the cliffs um, in, a, in isolated, which is a critical part of any Europe, isolated that urban terrain, uh, inserted anti-tank capabilities into the city through the special forces to disrupt the enemy's defense before the main body approached. Uh, there was still a close fight in Earth, and it was still a requirement to do combined arms maneuver by the attacker to clear enough of the terrain um, to say that they held it. And most importantly, not the most important, but also importantly, is something that we often do in our training, and I see all the time, is that you know, we plan an attack, Attack happens, takes a long time to do, especially, and then we just stop. Like, yeah, we'll say we're posturing for the counter uh, counterattack, all that. So in this battle, as it unfolded, you know, isolated from four sides, dismounted forces popping up everywhere. Um, the the main body taking the, the, the peri-urban city, as we call it, bringing artillery up then to that last point of departure of that peri-urban in the south of the main city, allowing them to, to bring up their combined arms better. Uh, they still had to do a close fight um, and, and clear it. And then once they clear, cleared it, the opposing former owners of the city mounted a very impressive counterattack. And had they not repelled that counterattack, it would have been lost. So that's, to me, this is the best example on every level of modern urban combat and in peer competition uh, that I can, I can use and I'm going to use. Uh, and with my uh, research associate, Harshana, we, we kind of try to piece together some uh, open source intelligence to paint the picture of the battle and what I think is important based on the urban nature. And again, the decisive objective, once it fell, Armenia had to surrender because that town, that fortress city, even from the ancient time was the gateway to the capital city uh, in the capital of the, what Armenia calls Nagorno-Karabakh or a different name they have for it. There were 10 kilometers from that city and, and it would have been, they could have, they could have destroyed the, the capital city just from um, artillery and other fire from, from Susha. So they had to surrender. Um, so the last thing that I'll talk about, uh, Mumbai, I, I had the pleasure of, as modern war to go there and walk the ground. If, if any listener doesn't know that, you know, they're basically their version of 9-11, they call it 26-11 in November of 2008. Really quickly, because I think it's, it, it gets to freeing your mind and your imagination of, uh, in war gaming. Um, 
uh, on those November of 26 of 2008, 10 heavily armed, inexperienced, you know, light bit of training, uh, terrorist operatives from Pakistan moved by sea from Pakistan into the Indian coast uh, through a phased operation uh, and then create, did it a seaborne insertion into the mega city of Mumbai. One of the, I think that the, the modern example of warfare, although it was a terrorist attack, I think it, sponsored by Pakistan, military ISI kind of, that's not controversial. Uh, they into a city and brought a mega city to its knees um, with just 10 lightly trained operatives. They, what I say is called the remotely controlled. So I think fascinating is it's a 10 military personnel, you know, lightly trained terrorists were remotely controlled through satellite and voice over internet protocol um, telephones in their ears. So as soon as they hit their landing spots, they put in the earphones and they were basically being controlled by military experts to execute a, a highly reconned, highly thought out attack of this mega city. So, and they use the city's flows again about what does a military commander need to understand about an urban environment? Um, this attack used the fact that Mumbai is, uh, is heavily um, concentrated with slums basically. So uh, high concentrations to include like million man slums of a class of individuals that aren't necessarily in the overall cities let's say population. So they landed in two fishing slums um, in two blow up vehicles that they had launched from their main boat, uh, painted either, even their boats were yellow to try to look like fishing boats. Um, a night insertion, which I did, I don't even know, I don't know who outside of the tier one festival should even do. Night insurgents, two locations in the city of Mumbai, split into four teams, uh, two team, one team of four and four teams of two, and somehow simultaneously hit six, six different locations, four fixed locations, and then they, two of the groups that took taxis to their objectives, um, put IEDs in the, in, or bombs in their, their taxis to explode on a timer almost simultaneously when they are attacking. So around 2100, uh, these heavily armed individuals were able to infiltrate a mega city dressed like tourists with backpacks, get into fortified structures and then hold them for almost three days. Uh, they had AK-47s, grenades, uh, a little bit of food with them and they were planning to die. Why I think is important and why I, I am deeply privileged to have studied it is because it brought the city to its knees, right? The, the, the emergency management system, although the Indian security apparatus responded immediately. And you had Navy, Marines, uh, QRF, uh, SWAT teams almost at every site immediately. Uh, but it overwhelmed the city so fast that the, the they thought there were 60 uh, terrorists hitting across the city. They thought they received over, I think it was like a, a 1,600 911 calls in a matter of uh, an hour. So it was like 400 a minute or something. It was just insane um, how they were able to create that chaos. I think it's important um, for many reasons um, across the range of military operations, but had that operation happened in a greater campaign of uh, any military, whatever military purpose, um, they won an international, they, they achieved their strategic objective, right? Getting international attention to the conflict. Uh, uh, they, they weren't, able to keep the anonymity that they would have because of the proxy forces, but they disrupted that city in a matter of 30 minutes for three days um, through that tactic. And had that, if you can imagine that disruption in a different major city, in a different war, how powerful, man, that's scary. Um, and with that, I'll end. I have a little bit about where everybody's investing in technology, but maybe we can get that in the questionnaires. Last plug is um, we're doing a course, the 40th ID, and, and it was an I had the ideal, they ran with it, to create an urban planner course 
which will have a component of an actual tabletop, what I'm calling a war game. Uh, if you're interested in, in, in you're in that position, you reach out to the POC. Uh, it, I think it's an amazing step forward on th this environment is, is the most difficult of any environment you'd ever do in military operation. And, and there's more to learn than I think that we're currently giving ourselves. Uh, with that, I'll, I think I hit my hour mark and I'd love to hand it over to questions to, to see what everybody else is thinking about. Hey brother, uh, that was a fantastic presentation, man. And it's a, it's abundantly clear that you've kept a steady stare at this, uh, this unique problem set of urban warfare and you, you mastered the subject really well. I mean, it's been a while since I've seen uh, you present on it, but uh, we've got a, a really amazing uh, audience here and there's already a lot of questions coming in um, and lots of good comments, a lot of uh, encouraging comments from the, the, the chat. Um, let's start with Charlie. Uh, Charlie, you had a question, uh, Charlie Bagshaw. Are you able to unmute and uh, ask your question, sir? If not, I can do it for you. I think I got it, I kind of pasted in here, but give you a chance to, Unmute if you're still on online. Okay, maybe he might not be able to. So the que the first question he put into the chat, John, was uh, in the urban, does modern technology act as the perceived force multiplier that is assumed, or is there simply a requirement for mass and overwhelming firepower still? I think we just lost our, our guest. It, it, hey, Ed, are you still there? Are you still around to verify we're still broadcasting? Yeah, you're still, you're still broadcasting on now. Okay. We'll just give John a second to get back in. He dropped off somehow. And while, while we're waiting for John to get back in, <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we boot you out on accident? What happened? <laughs> I don't know. I, that's never happened to me. Like, first question, <laughs> I'm out. Okay. Uh, well, were we able to get that? Did you? No, did you I got, I got nothing. Okay. It froze. Me, me up. Yeah, and, and before, while I get to that question, everybody, you know, please feel free to raise your hands. And uh, we we like to make this in Flight Club. You know, these webinars interactive. Um, and and John's keen to see you or hear from you personally, not not me having to read your questions. So if you have the ability to unmic or uh, share your video, uh, there's, there's Anthony King. Good to see you, there's sir. Tony. There's Tony. There you go. Um, Hold up. So, you have a question, sir. Go ahead or comment. Well, is that okay to jump in? Are you sure? Yeah, of course, please. Thanks for the. Uh, it's always lovely to hear you. Um, and and you know, very, you know, really interesting. I I I've got to say I found the, this the little chat on Susha uh, both fascinating and I I think it's a highly pertinent example in terms of interstate warfare. Uh, illustrating what you're what you're saying and what I also would argue um, very strongly. So so thanks for that. Um, look, I'm going to ask a totally unfair question, um, but, but it's kind of really getting uh, uh, getting to you to help me with my next project. Um, and I just wonder whether you had any thoughts. So when you know I've, I've just finished this thing on 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 sort of urban battle, and I want to think about the the issue of. What's the issue, you know, what's the future of urban warfare in the light of the potential of disruptive technology? So that complex of AI, machine learning, um, remote, autonomous, robotic systems, you know, and obviously I'm kind of skeptical of the kind of Terminator vision, as you'd imagine. But I just wondered, you know, whether you or any other member of the audience had any thoughts on you know, what do we, what, what, what will we think about what, if, you know, both the US military and the UK and indeed most of the leading other European militaries are seriously trying to embrace AI, cyber, et cetera, et cetera, and that remote revolution, remote autonomous revolution, if it's going to be a revolution in my mind, as I say, what, what do we, do we, any thoughts in terms of what the urban battle is going to look like or what urban operations might look like? in terms of that um, yeah I'm, I'm more than more okay. than happy okay, unfair one i accept but that would be my question no no I, i'm more than happy to, to i know that's what you're looking at next and again anthony has come out with one of the most important recent publications that i think will happen in the last 20 years his book uh look it up uh urban warfare in the 21st century i think if, if i get it correct 
Yeah, so one of the two slides that I failed because I'm a terrible presenter to get to was about kind of the investments most countries are making for urban operations, right? So one slide on the Russian and Chinese investments in our investments, our modernization campaign in robotics, uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, in long range precision guided munition. You know, basically I could give another presentation where I take the, the priorities and where I think they would impact. Most investments are in that robotics, for, in the relation to urban warfare are in those robotics, which is interesting. It's still uh, important of those eight rules that I have for urban warfare, believing in the close fight, how do you reduce um, casualty aversion and risk to your own soldiers uh, and increase your precision as in the not the loss of civilian life. So right, so you have some robotic apparatus before of you that can gain and maintain or gain contact with the enemy to take away one of those rules. I think that's a heavy investment, whether it's a rope, Israeli D9 remote controlled, you know, all these hard learned lessons that we talk about, I think is the way the future that we're investing in. And I agree with that one. Um, your ability to take away that, that, that game, the rule of the game. Where I see our artificial intelligence, one is that none of that stuff works without good software. Uh, so like the US military has like a software battalion which, that I wish there was more urban focus, but um, the investments in, in, in that uh, lowering the cost threshold for some of these apparatuses. Artificial intelligence for me, and I just did a talk with the, uh, the Netherlands has a really good project that you should look into was looking at uh, artificial intelligence impact on logistics, right? So artificial intelligence is just supposed to reduce to me the cognitive load of these operations that are so complex because of, again, the environment. So how can that speed my, my that getting me the information I need up to, to understand the environment to achieve my mission. Uh, I don't invest in artificial intelligence increasing the kill time or the you know, shooter to sensor to, to do the killing for me. Yeah. I think artificial intelligence will change the nature of urban combat in the future by reducing the complexity to make a decision, whether that's a course of action decision or whether that's a logistical, real-time logistical knowledge and prompting the people that need to know um, what's at threat, what's low, what's, what, what's that? I, I think it'll be in this reduction of cognitive load um, across the formation. And, and you, again, praise to you, even your mission command and your um, command book, which is another must read, even on the staff. Um, I don't know though, if I see the artificial intelligence pursuits and investments going in that direction versus um, overall operational environment increase, increasing the sensor attack, right? Because yeah. then, I, to me, that gets to that the whole all weather thing, right? So Battle of Susha has some fog rolls in and most of my investments are now null and void. Uh, and even did I know that, that was happening, you know, you know all, all that that question. I hope that answers it. I, I, that cognitive load though, I think about the most. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I've just started the project and it's, to be honest, quite scary and confusing, but I mean, I think, that's yeah i don't quite understand how you how you would use machine learning for current operations i don't see where the i don't quite see where the data is but i mean i i'm that's a total skeptics reply and an ignorant person's reply i, I look you know i'm yeah i mean I, I i the plan is to try and have a little look at it um i'll, so, I'll, shut, up, I'll shut up now though yeah. yeah one of my wish list things tony and, and for the fight club my, one of my wish list things that i've written about in the past is google war I don't know what the question I need to ask, yeah. even, and I never did in combat. I need the ability to rapidly ask somebody an answer to a question, whether it was, so where are all the cranes in this city at this moment? Where are the bulldozers? Where, what are the things that are going to help me adapt? I need Google war, like we're used to in our civilian life for the military to be able to ask the question I don't know I need. Yeah, th 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 thanks, that John. Yeah, really, really helpful. I'll, I'll mute myself now and let other people. Yeah, that, that's great. But thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, brilliant. So thanks yeah. to the Fight Club for organizing it. Uh, thanks, Dr. King. Uh, hey, Fergus, Bryce, are you you online, mate? Go ahead and uh, can you unmute and ask your question? There you go. Hey, John. Can you hear me? Okay. I do. I hear you great. Yeah, that was an awesome talk. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, my question is around um, task org and what your dream oh, yeah. task org would be going into the break-in battle. 
if you could choose whatever you wanted in there. Yeah, that's so excellent. Oh man, I didn't I didn't get to that. You know, you know, I I don't I I I I like if I do an interview, I don't like people giving me the questions ahead of time. I want to be able to develop my own professional skills. You know, urban combat is not an infantry fight. Uh, it's also not a disaggregated capability fight. So I don't personally like war games where you have pieces that you put on the board, right? I got an infantry unit I'm going to put here. I got, you know, I'm going to give them an artillery. I'm going to give, I hate that. Uh, I think that y- you need the ability to task organize like the reality of combat has shown where you better have a mixture of uh, close uh, fire support mortars artillery uh whether you know, in that in that person's command of control uh you better have engineers task organized at the both you better have explosive ordnance um the task organized so i would recreate i just wipe the screen and, and recreate um the task organization that isn't the the pucks that i usually get to put on the board um and you know tony uh, again so glad to see him uh you know, mission always matters. So I need the ability, um, but the problem, here's the problem why I love this question and what I see. So I recently watched an attack. I won't say who was doing it, uh, attack of a city, a very big city uh, in the course of action uh, had the breach of the exterior and, and then flowing infantry in, into, the, into the fight. Uh, that's not what I would do and not what they had at, at their availability. Um, you need mobile protective firepower with that infantry, or they're just you're just feeding them into the wood chipper. Um, whether that's you lead with a an armor element, do you lead with a bulldozer that you don't even have? Do you lead with a tank that, mm, unfortunately, a lot of people are giving away? Um, you're not going to, it depends on the task again. So if you were telling me you were deploying into theater for something else, it might increase your intelligence capabilities down to the company level because you, you need um, geo intelligence, you need human intelligence in this environment unlike any other environment. But if you're talking about, which I do what I tell everybody not to do is I focus on the offense and the attack, you better have mobile protective firepower. I hate the striker. Uh, you better have concrete penetrating capabilities with you, whether that's man portable, uh, whether that's towable, whether that's self-driven, something that can penetrate a fortified building. As I, like I said in my presentation, number one thing that you don't task us for and you end up having to. Um, and then like, so I agree that Susha or the Nagana Karabakh taught us that you better have some type of air defense and force protection of your critical capabilities with you. E- EW, so I'd add in some EWs. I did create, I don't know if it, it'd be helpful. I created, somebody pushed me a few years ago to say mega city operation. What would your mega cities unit look like? So I wrote a paper on what a mega cities unit I, I would design look like. It isn't new stuff. It's just combining our stuff differently. But the issue we have is that we train them all separately. Right, so we train our infantrymen over there. We train our artillery over there. We train our armor forces over there. I don't see anybody that combines them um, really the way it's going to work. Matter of fact, there, there's actually very few urban training sites that you can put the right assets into it because of the different regu- regulations. And, and, and I love my Israeli friends, but they have one of the best urban warfare training sites in the world and they can't put track vehicles inside of it. Hey, this is kind of cool. You know, I'm watching a ranger talk to the U.S. Ranger. This, uh, so, thanks, Fergus. Um, hey, Des, thanks, um, got to mute Max here. Max, you're, you're hot. Like you. Hey, Des, go with your question, sir. Go ahead. You're, you're, uh, you're still not unmuted, Des. No? Okay. Yeah, I'll go up here. So you had a good uh, comment here in the feed. Um, hey, can I answer one of the questions I saw in the feed really quick? Because I think okay. it's 
John, it's pretty important. It's something I'm working on. I, I'm actually going to try to publish it soon about the Battle of Susha, which I think is a great comment about, hey, l- did you look at the 1994 battle, which involved the fall of the city without attacking into it, uh, which is a great comment in a creative war gaming of how do you shape, how do you take terrain without entering it? Um, in that battle, they attack the peri-urban spaces and draw the defenders out. So created a moment that the defenders had to come out, uh, which is has historical relevance to it as well. Um, but it could lend you to stuff like Dr. King has presented about that. That's a change on the size of our militaries and capabilities in that battle, which I, I, I hope to hit in my article in the 1994 battle of Susha, they attacked what was important to them at the the defenders and draw the defenders out, which is another thinking through wargaming, like how could you get the enemy to give up its defensive advantage or its decisive advantage? Um, and that was the lesson right of, of Sider City 2008. We, we just surrounded them by concrete walls and made them come out and fight us. And it just you know, caused a, kind of the, the, the overall objective to be achieved. John, uh, I got you. Yeah, I've managed to un, unscramble my computer. Uh, sorry. Yeah, my, my question is, um, and, and it's probably uh, from the lens of uh, Western democracy, but how important is it, do you think, that actually if we terrify our opponent, um, the, the advantage it re- overall, history would suggest, that probably reduces casualties. Uh, and you can look back through history, what Genghis Khan did, uh, some of the siege warfare in the 18th century, use of flamethrowers uh, and weapons like that. They, they are terrifying. So it's tactics as well as the operational level. Terrifying is, uh, and, and you, you front load your casualties or the, the imposition of casualties early on in the campaign, but arguably overall it saves, saves lives. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I love that line of thinking and, um, even in some of the previous, I love the the tactical psychology presentation part of the the, the war game before about frame. I'm a huge fan of th- flamethrowers, um, and just like that presentation, it isn't necessarily about what they can do. It's about the psychological effect they can have on the enemy if they know they're present. I mean, one of the reasons I do what I do is I say that I want all militaries of the wor- world to get better at urban operations so it stops happening in urban terrain, um, because if you get better at it, war the trends of warfare show you that that um, occurrence stops happening. And I usually you know, say trench warfare, right? So trench warfare was the dominant form of warfare until it wasn't because you figured out a way to make it so it's no longer an advantage to you. Well, we're not there even anywhere near it in urban operations where we're putting fear in people to where they stop choosing the urban terrain as the, the, the preferred battle location. Uh, and until we do, until we get better at it, right? To where, to where it's not this attritional, uh, positional, there's an argument there, fight. All the advantages, all the trends will push enemies, I don't care what level they are, into the urban terrain, which then, you're right, causes more casualties, more friendly, you know, more military casualties, more civilian casualties, more political risk, which is sometimes argued away, you know, in, in our thinking the political risk is huge and it has decided battles on it wasn't worth the political risk we're pulling out um and that if i'm the the other side that's what i want to do and there isn't anybody that i know of that doesn't have that concern right so grozny again another case study that i'll show the, the russian military did have huge amount of political risk on what their people thought was happening as more bodies started coming home um that did impact their urban operations. I think it's a great point. I mean, I kind of struggle in my own mind with, you know, a, a John Boyd kind of theory of fight the enemy and not the terrain. Um, but then you know, in overall campaigning, the terrain can become so decisive that, no, no, I'm, I'm fighting the terrain. Um, you could argue that, yeah, you know, capital cities have fallen in the past. It doesn't, that doesn't end a war. The, the, you still got to destroy the army. It, it's complex, right? I, yeah, I think it's a huge investment that you have to show dominance in this so that the enemy 
doesn't choose it, doesn't think that that's where he's going to gain his advantage. Right now, based on the situation where we're at, all of us, even I, if I'm the bad guy or if I'm the good guy, I'm going to choose Urban Terrain to fight from. Hey, thanks for that question, Des. Um, we're going to go over to Charlie next. And uh, John, so Charlie here has a, oh my gosh, I got my little puppy here crying. Charlie has this really cool uh, inflatable uh, urban train thing that he might want to tell you about. He, 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 that's not his question, but uh, since he's online, maybe he just makes a plug here for that thing that we got to see at DSET. Hey, go ahead, Charlie, you have, you have your question. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I got you. Perfect. It's just uh, I was looking at the controls on my computer as well at the same time and not falling in the same trap. I had to step out for a bit, so I missed uh, missed uh, um, some of the talk. But um, you know what uh, what we were showing at DSET was our inflatable wall system, um, which we as a company have sold into U.S. Air Force, British Army, and again, it's, you know, it's one of those systems that allows allows people to train in a fairly you know, routine in barracks. You know, looking at the low level skills. There's one of the things I noted down when we were talking about. You were talking about earlier about the flexibility of people to react to the situation that's in front of them. Um, and, you know, my basis for my military career was you, know, you can only you can only build that agility when you've got that firm foundation of basic skills put in the right in the, in the same place. So I know there's a lot of criticism around SWAT tactics and all that sort of stuff and room entry drills. And, you know, but if actually you smash a wall through it, smash a hole through a wall, mouse holing uh, from building to building like we were learned in the 1940s. Uh, let alone uh, you know, the early 2000s in places like Basra and, uh, and Fallujah, you know, you've still got to enter that next area uh, and clear that room in a sensible fashion. So you know, it's that its ability to create those foundations. But you know, my question earlier on was about, um, was about mass and, and technology. Uh, when I was a squadron leader, which was about in, I remember that I've been now, about 2000, 2012, 2013, uh, I had the lead for looking at armour integration into urban tactics, so dismounted infantry, urban. And I spent a lot of time looking at the lessons that you as the US learned in, uh, in your Battle of Fallujah, uh, both the first and the second time round, um, and looking how we can integrate armour better into dismounted operations, protecting the armour, but the armour providing the extra fire support to, to the infantry. And it came really obvious to me as I looked at you know, recent conflict and back into the 1940s and battles like Caen uh, in northern France uh, as we moved out of D-Day, that, you know, not a lot had changed. The lessons about not working your way down the street, or actually working your way down the street, but don't actually be on the street, but, you know, fight from building to building by breaking through holes in walls, um, seem to ring true a lot of the time. And you've mentioned it in some of your podcasts before about, you know, in the subterranean having to go back to long pieces of string to know where you've been because your gps isn't working underground um so it's, yeah the question was really about you know we we as military you know, modern militaries you know get very um fixed on modern technology what new technologies can do for us and what we have we as industry i'm now on the dirty side of industry but um you know what we're thinking of are great new ideas and how we can you know, increase firepower and all this sort of stuff and information operations but for me the, in the urban environment a lot of that just falls apart uh, it doesn't matter how good your digital radio is. If it's you know, if you're working in the urban environment, you, you've got you've got holes that are not going to allow you to communicate. You know, back to things like tank telephones on the back of your armored vehicle, so you can talk to the crew inside the vehicle. Um, if we move away from um, you know some of the sighting systems to be able to spot, you know, put lasers onto, so the infantry can put lasers onto buildings. But if you've only got thermal sights on a tank, you're not going to be able to see where those laser sights are actually pointing. So there's lots of little low level stuff. Um, and when we move on with technology, does it actually give us an advantage in the urban environment or, or as actually is mass the critical thing? Yeah, that's a great ending question uh, on, on mass. Um, context always matters. So if I can get a formation to commit to the what type of urban environment? They're not all the same. Uh, what type of urban environment and what type of enemy? Uh, and then what is the mission? Let's say we agree on all those. Uh, if the mission is, you know, a high intensity fight, um, like I said, in the, in the overall aspect of the shaping operation, we're never going to be able to mask what we used to be able to. Uh, just, and I agree with Dr. King on our, the size of our militaries, um, where we are looking to technologies to make up for that. Uh, I, I don't think that that, I also am not as big of a fan that we don't do combined arms maneuver in dense urban terrain because it, 
it breaks up our ability to maneuver. Um, it disperses us, things like that. I, I still think that that overall concept that's there. Um, I th mass is the principle of war. I don't think you're ever going to get away with it in order to destroy your enemy force. Um, and it's about bringing the right amount of mass at the right moment. Now, the problems in urban terrain is that that's that's the problem, right? Is you know, I could just say that you know I used to say it prevents the ability for the enemy and the attacker to mass. Is that as necessary or is the ability to stop momentum more important uh, or, and the ability to maintain momentum more important is a, another associated question in my mind when I think about especially your know, high intensity large scale fights. And that's why I, I, I think um, it all comes back to what you were saying about what is the foundations of this form of warfare in this environment. Uh, I'm a believer in mastering CQB uh, using different assets, everything from virtual to on the ground, not virtual reality, but you know, synthetic. Um, if, and, and I think we're really bad at giving ourselves a, a grade report. That's another problem with close quarters battle is that there's a, there isn't a standardization of, of, of really what, unless you're in a special community of really what it, what right looks like, what, what's really going to get people hurt, what's not. Um, and that's one of the problems is, is, it, is not standardized um, because there's only a certain amount of people that are required to train it. Most people don't have close quarters schools. Um, would that be the basic that I would, so if we're talking about, if you want to create mass, what are the basics? You know, if I do this, um, the, you, you and I are familiar with, if I take the overall task and I break that to subtask, you know, what's going to be the, at the very bottom of that, the basic is exactly what you were talking about, the moving through the urban terrain to maintain momentum. Uh, so what's the formation got to look like to do that? I, I got to have engineers with me. I got to have mobile protective firepower. And like you said, what I see gaps in my military is just the, the basic skill to move with a vehicle, yeah. dismounted in a mounted asset, like you said, even be able to communicate it, but just what are the right tactics um, that will, it's, it's so lost for me. There's a bunch of reasons for that. And I tried to hit them even for me. So I'm a, I love flamethrowers. I also love smoke. If, if, again, if I, if my objective is you create mass, I, I got to have the ability to move. I got to be able to bring new capabilities together. I have to take away that, that advantage that the, the static enemy has. I don't have any uh, obscuration or camouflage capabilities. I'm moving. Um, we took, uh, we, the U.S. military, took all of our smoke generation capabilities off our vehicles. We used to have a button you push and it dumps diesel on the manifolds. I don't know yeah. if you guys remember that. We took that off. So our, for some reason, our, the future that we imagine of combat doesn't involve a lot of smoke. Or if it does, it's artillery delivered smoke. Uh, it's where, I don't know if most people don't, if they don't know about this, but I caught it where we in the Battle of Mosul, we wanted to provide smoke to our partner force, which is a, a big trend, right? So what capabilities you want them to be able to do in urban terrain? We didn't have artillery smoke in the CENTCOM theater of operations. So we used white phosphorus, which looks really, it smokes really well, uh, but it looks really bad in information warfare when you're dropping white phosphorus artillery to attack a hospital, which is why not attack it, but they they were attacking it because they wanted to save people that were in the hospital, so they dropped white phosphorus. Uh, they didn't. Call, it just looks really bad. But these are those. If I break down, like we agree on the task, all the way down to the bottom. To me, you know, that the infantry CQB, um, I would say yes, and build upon what happens if you can't enter the room. Like, how are you going to maintain? audacity and speed and you know, uh but there's like all this other stuff that is just not even attempted uh and, and one of those being like you said moving with a vehicle like who's doing it even right now but i think i think you're right then i think uh, what what i would have observed when i was a squadron leader and i kind of hope that a lot of that has changed now it may not have changed when i was when i was an observer mentor after after being a squadron leader you know the people's ability to 
apply even our own doctrine into the urban environment in a simulated environment they weren't able to they just end up doing normal rural tactics into urban environments and yes. then wonder why they all got dead um there's a lot of it is so fundamental at the low level um that you know the the four-man fire team not getting their drills right an individual not getting their drills right ends up with the whole thing falling apart and i think in the urban environment it, it it becomes more apparent when you haven't got those um combined arms integrated skills at the lowest level at the section level at the fire team level you know, a fire team knowing how to bring forward a team of engineers to blow a hole in a wall or how to protect an armored vehicle whether it's their own vehicle or somebody else's so it's i think it's the environment which really 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 shows shortfalls in in understanding and training so yes agree hey thanks charlie um unfortunately gosh you're you, John, you definitely broke the record in amount of uh, questions and comments. Uh, we, we had a lot of engagement tonight um, or this afternoon for you. So a big round of applause uh, if, if we were here, for, you know, physical. Um, and a big thanks to you for taking the time to share with us um, today. Um, that was really impactful. And uh, please stay connected with us. And we, we, we look forward to following all your work and research as you continue to press, press the attack on, on urban warfare. Um, Ed, if you can jump on. We, we just want to do a quick, you know, PSA public service announcements uh, for, for, the, for our Fight Club members. Um, I'll start off the game licenses. We, we worked out Slytherin, Battlefront, uh, Matrix games. They've really, you know, came, you know, met, met us halfway to, to be very flexible with Fight Club and how we do our licensing. So uh, be on the lookout for some new guidance on how we're going to license our games. Um, so combat mission, uh, flashpoint campaigns, and we'll be soon, as we, you see on the, the point there, ball three, a new concept cable demonstrator to integrate command P, P, PE command professional edition. So uh, a lot of a lot of stuff coming out here as we get going to the summer. Um, Ed, you want to jump on and I think we got the take that hill the 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 the, the manual game that's uh, in print now. We'll be getting soon. Ed, are you still online? Yeah, I'm still there. So uh, take that hill. Super uh, satellites. Yeah, so Take That Hill samples being shipped, so we should get some physical copies uh, within about two months, assuming that goes well. Uh, sweeping satellites, look out for that at Connections uh, UK in September. Um, personally, I just want to say thanks to John for a great presentation. It's always good when the questions are still coming in at the end. Lots of food for thought for the Take That Street, the urban war game primer that we're working on. Uh, and I think I just want to lay down a challenge to the Fight Club members on the call. Uh, using... Uh, combat mission uh, the challenge is to design a urban penetration scenario and then circulate that for people to make up that dream task org uh, and then we can discuss that uh, as and when so that's the challenge from from me to you and i'll be happy to take part and uh ed wouldn't want to do this but uh he's pretty modest but if, if you see on the note down there for the queen's birthday honors list um we had hit him and uh charlie get recognized last month and so or this month so big congrats to them that's a big deal um for those for, for them represent the fight club and, and from what they do in, in the british army uh really real big congratulations for for getting that kind of recognition so uh you see on the left uh john carlo from i don't think he's on tonight but uh he he wrote a nice article on fight club it's in italian but uh he, he put a big spread in the italian army magazine on UK Fight Club. So uh, if you want to check that out, that's out there online. Um, and there's there continues to be a lot of publications on, on the idea and on, on, on the ideas and what we're doing. So uh, check out our website and stay plugged in on Twitter. But again, thank you so much, John. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, huge success tonight. You, did, you definitely broke a couple records for, uh, for people's interest uh, constantly. I mean, there's a lot of questions you can answer. So just continue the discourse on, uh, on our Slack for those that are in Fight Club or you know, for those that are guests. Get on to Twitter, get on LinkedIn, and pepper John with more questions because uh, he's got a lot of knowledge to share. But uh, without further, if there's anything final, uh, that's it from us. And uh, we're really grateful for everyone joining in tonight. Thank you.